three, two, one. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining for another live interview on tonight's History Live. Today I have a very, very special guest. Um, her name is Kara Cooney. Um, you may know her as she has appeared in many, many documentaries. Um, so many that we actually feel that we know Kara um, very well, personally, I think. Um, Dr. Kara Cooney is also an author and a professor at UCLA. And Kara specializes in ancient Egyptian craft production, um, economies in the ancient world, and coffin studies. Kara is also a very passionate scholar about strong ancient women. Hi, Kara. Hey, Curtis, how are you doing? Nice to be here. Oh, I'm great. Thank you so much for, for joining. It's so great to, to get to, to pick your brain a little bit tonight. Uh, my, yeah, go for it. I, I have no idea. Well, actually, you send me questions that you're going to ask me, but I looked at the first two and then I had to go back to doing something else <laughs> in my crazy life. So all of, most of these questions will be heard for the first time. So surprise me and let's, let's see what happens. Oh, good. Oh, good. So we're going to get like direct, real answers. <laughs> yes, candid. Nothing thought through. <laughs> well, Kara, I, I first wanted to start um, by getting to know you a little better. Um, so I'm going to start off with a couple personal questions, if that's all right with you. Always. So, Kara, you know, we all feel that we know you really well because we've seen you on so many documentaries, but... Um, I, I don't think we know how exactly your fascination with history started. Where did it all come from? Uh, this is a question that one Egyptologist rarely asks another Egyptologist because we all know that there is no reasonable answer. So in terms of my interest and my need to study this place, I've got nothing for you. I have no idea. It's weird and strange. Wouldn't my mother love to know? Um, wouldn't I love? <laughs> Um, it's just bizarre. But as for why I'm able to do it as a professor and as a profession, that would be because I, I would give you two reasons. One, because I grew up upper middle class in the United States and was given the privilege and education to be able to do it. And number two, because I'm a woman. And so as academia started to be privatized and started to be seen as a less than optimal uh, profession, women were very much allowed to go into this field. And I remember growing up and my brother, um, Jim Cooney, is, is just as academically minded as I am, just as much of a puzzler and, and interested in, in these kinds of historical questions. And I saw him deciding that he needed to become a lawyer. So um, it's interesting that as we were, it, as things in the 80s and 90s were developing in terms of gender, and there was still this understanding that a man had to have this profession and that a woman, well, you know, you can do whatever you want. Um, go do the academic, silly, puffy thing, sweetheart. Um, I think I was allowed to do it in a way that that my brother was not. And so I think my gender plays a part in this, too, because I was able to take a risk in terms of my profession that many people, men around me were not of the same generation. So was it, it's was interesting. It people, now, had that, um, people had that mentality that, Oh, a woman must just, you know, get married, have kids, be in the kitchen, stay there. I mean, this has all happened in my generation, right? I'm a Gen Xer. I'm going to be 50 in a year. When I was growing up, you know, when you lived with a boyfriend, you know, I grew up Roman Catholic, shocking thing. Now it's de rigueur. Now it's normal. And the world has very quickly changed into this new direction. And we talk about sexuality being non-binary. We talk about all kinds of things that we didn't talk about when I was growing up. And of course, gay marriage is the law of the land in the United States and every state, whether they want it or not. So the gender shifts within the last two generations have been extraordinary to behold and that has touched everything. It has touched professions, it has touched who's allowed to go into certain professions, how things work. Um, and of course, it, isn't it interesting that rampant and unregulated capitalism which, in which everyone must work within an inch of their lives, male or female, may be the very thing that takes down the patriarchy. But, um, but that's a big, that's another thing. So I got all political with your first question when you're trying to get to know me personally, Curtis, which I think is how you are get. it is a personal thing. And the people who know me know that I immediately get all um, fire and brimstone in, in some of my social beliefs. So yeah. 
It's not just about me. Is what I it is, is what great I'm because I mean it is important also to share your your feelings about the world. That is personal, I believe, as well. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I, I keep my my thoughts to myself, and then sometimes I say something. People are like, oh, "We didn't expect that from you." So. <laughs> oh no, that's that's me every day. Like, <laughs> it it just is. I I, I have a very direct. Um, I don't, I just, I, it's not that I don't suffer fools. I, I, I do suffer a lot of fools in my life. I just, that, um, I just, I appreciate honesty and I would rather go there, but it does mean that people, I have had friends who are like, oh, I just can't deal with this level of directness. And so I can be a little, um, for some people, a little hard to be around, I suspect, because I do have an intensity that can get kind of annoying. <laughs> It's good to know these things about but oneself, it's, right? It's so, so yeah. interesting you say that, like being outspoken. Um, Diane and Aiden are on, and yeah. when I when I interviewed Aiden, um, we spoke about a controversial documentary and things like that. And I said to him, "Nobody changes history without causing a bit of controversy." So I think it's important to to do that. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, yeah, and with my next book, I'm putting myself out there a little bit more, but we'll see what happens with that one. That won't be out till November, so. Wow. Yes, Can I'm going over it now, which is why it's on the brain. I'm going over the edits. I'm like, am I gonna say that? I guess I'm gonna say that, here we go. So we'll see. Yeah. Exactly, what, what's the title? It's called The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt in the Modern World. Oh, okay, yes. interesting, interesting. Yeah, authoritarianism, how it works, how it works in, in how it worked in Egypt and what we can learn from that authoritarianism. Yeah, yeah. Not totalitarian, totalitarianism. Not totalitarianism as much. That's more of a modern concept, but um, you know, I've been doing some of this research about different states, how things work, how you communicate uh, power. And one of the theses in my book is that the Egyptians excelled at communicating power as moral goodness. As, as something that we accept and we love. And that is something that I think many a politician would want to learn from today. And uh, it is something that is still very attractive to us, that fatherly safety. Yes. Um, but of course the dangers that go along with it are real. So that's the kind of, those are the kinds of questions that I'm, I'm working with. Yeah, well, that sounds so interesting. I can't wait to, to see that, to read that book. Yeah. Yeah. Me, me too, man. Um, I'm in the edits. I, I pulled two all-nighters this week trying to get through all of the edits and footnotes. So let, I'm, I want it out there too. <laughs> I need it to be done and moved on. So yeah. Well, I'm staying tuned for that. But I wanted to to know. You said your brother was interested in history, but became a lawyer because he was basically told you have to get a real job. What do you, what does your brother think of what you do now? And what do your parents think? What did they think or what do they think now? Um, I, they, they are, um, uh, yeah, stunned and surprised all the time. My mother will just say, oh, Kara, you know, yeah, you always have 18 things going on. I guess you'll just figure it out and do it. And um, I think they just, uh, they, they love it though. When, when I went to, my brother's an assistant attorney general. What's his title? He's head of emergency litigation in the state of New York. So he has um, some fun and interesting things to do. Yeah, um, and the last time I was up in New York, I did a public lecture and the whole family came, my niece and nephew, and um, I get to New York a lot. So they, they're, they're very much a part of my work because as any Egyptologist on this call knows, first thing you do when you go to New York is you go to the Met, hang out with the people there, look at the objects and and I've brought my family with me to the Met and they've met people. It's just, it's great, you know? So um, New York is like a second Egyptological home. Yeah. Yeah. So, and as for what my parents think, Curtis, um, they, they love it. And my mother just said this last time, she's like, this book you're writing now, you know, this, because my mother is very politically interested. She has had MSNBC on for the last year, I swear to God. And those of you who are in the United States, you know what that means. So she's, and they, she's in Texas, right? So you also know what that means to be an MSNBC watcher in Texas. But she's like, this book you're writing, Kara, I can't wait. It'll be the first book you've written that I'll actually want to read. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really funny. Um, so that gives you a bit of an insight into, into what I deal with it, in the family. Well, they sound very supportive. I think that's that's very important. So, yeah. And and your parents have they been with you to Egypt at any point? No, 
No. no, and we tried to do to do a trip um, not long ago, but my mother has had um, three hip replacements. You count that up in your mind and think of what that means. Yeah. Um, and so it's a it's you know she gets around okay, but Egypt is hard and it's hard on the body in many places. And I was like, well, we could do it, but you know she also now needs um, knee replacements. My poor beautiful mother, and so it's it's just hard I think for me to think of her doing all that walking and up and down stone steps and uneven ground, and it worries me. So I just haven't, I you know I think they would love it. They would love to go. Yeah. Um, and maybe we'll be able to figure that out someday but for now we'll we'll leave it and they can just you know watch me i don't do much tv anymore curtis as you know um so you still they, do. they won't even get to watch me doing that i i am involved in media but in other ways i'm not doing the the doc the documentary thing as much anymore well you, you still do appear in a lot of documentaries most of the time i'm watching tv and i'm like um, let me watch this documentary i'm like okay there's salima usual um oh there's kara look there <laughs> <laughs> I have been in a couple, um, but yeah, it's it's harder and harder for me to participate. I think they like people on the ground in Egypt these days. That seems to be much preferred. And uh, when I'm in Egypt, coming all the way from California, you know what that's like coming all the way from South Africa. That's an investment in time. Yeah. That and I and I have a ten year old son. I can't be away for very long. So when I'm in Egypt, every moment counts, and I can't take two or three days to go shoot a documentary these days. I need to get in and get my work done yeah. so that I have data for publication and, and for my grad students. So that's that's where my my um, agenda is these days when I go to Egypt. Yeah, yeah. And does, does your son, is he interested in history like his mom? No way in hell. That boy, that that Taurus born under the full moon, if you believe in that kind of thing, and I didn't used to, but then I gave birth to one, and oh my goodness, um, that stubborn child is um, he he. When we go to a museum, and this is you know maybe now with COVID, he would be thrilled to go, but he's like, ah, another museum, mom, this is horrible. I hate these places because he sees the museum. You know, when I would take him as a kid, I'd be doing a talk, I would be, you know, public lecture, and then I'd do a book signing, or I would do something. He sees it as something that takes his mother away from him. And, um, and he, he just is not into the whole museum thing, the whole history thing. But it's funny, his favorite subjects in school are um, social studies and, and those kinds of, uh, he loves people as much as I am. So my son, whether he professes to hate history and Egyptology or not, which of course he does, is as much of an anthropologist as I am. Yeah. And so we, we in COVID have been taking long walks and we look at, we check out people's houses, we talk about the people, we're always people watching and, and um, we're very interested in the same thing. So from that perspective, I think when he's older, he'll get what I do, <laughs> but not now, <laughs> not now. <laughs> For now, he, he just, he's, he's got other things on his mind, so. Oh yeah, yeah. He's in he's in uh, rock band classes, so he's he's a very able drummer. For those of you that are friends of me on Facebook, you've seen some of his drumming. He's pretty damn good, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to really encourage that. And there's a drum set in my garage. I gotta close the door because it gets super loud. <laughs> he's into Green Day, and he can play all those fills. He's he's good. That's where we're channeling his extraordinary energy. Yeah, yeah. So maybe one of these days we'll we'll get to see a music video of his or something. Yeah. 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 Sounds, sounds like a, like a plan. Yeah. But I, I, yeah. Totally, I totally understand what you mean about like going to a museum with someone. When I go to a museum um, with like Filippo and he's like, okay, you get three hours and go. And he sits on a bench and plays on his phone. It's different. That's My mom, <laughs> my mom is so into Egyptology. Sometimes she knows things that I don't know. I'm like, how did you know that? Um, so sometimes when we go to museums, she's the one who I have to drag out. So <laughs> I get both sides. Museums are tough. And, um, you know, I, I can spend a whole day in a museum, no matter what it does to my poor back. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think many can. But there was, I have one museum visit. The first time as a, as a very uh, fresh graduate student when I went to the Louvre in Paris and I thought, okay, and at that point I was like, every museum I go to, I would try to digitally document with my new digital camera, every piece in the museum. <laughs> and you can, 
you know, and do it and the label and do it in the label. So you have that documentation, you have it in your computer. You're like, I have what's on display and I can go and look at these things. You have kind of a study collection if you like. And I remember as a fresh young graduate student going to the Louvre and thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. And I, by the, I don't know, the sixth room of one masterpiece after another, I just sat down and I cried because I, I couldn't <laughs> handle the, the amount of beauty in that place. And it was just overwhelming. It was just overwhelming. Because you, you, you know, the Egyptologist wants to try to remember what's where and what's yes. important. I don't do this as much anymore. I don't, I don't torture myself in this way anymore. But you know, when you're a student, you're like, I must know it all. And I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. It was too overwhelming. Yeah. I'm like, everything's here. They're all here. And of course the Cairo Museum does the same to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Cairo Museum, you can spend forever there. So, and it's, it's, you're always trying to, to, you know, I spent the one time at the Cairo Museum, I think it was something like nine hours. Um, <laughs> And we only did like the first floor. <laughs> yeah. 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 So where it's was funny, the- It's funny, I'm always working in the Cairo Museum. I don't, I don't get to explore and look around as much because I need to go in, do this work on my objects and then they kick me out because they're closing or we're exhausted and it's done. And I'm like, how weird is it that I'm always in this structure, I'm always in this building and yet I don't get to wander around and look at things. Yeah. And it's, it's just funny the way that, that works out, but. Mm. And now they've taken everything from our dear Cairo Museum <laughs> and they're all in different places and it's all, you know, confusing about what's where. So um, it's, it's now a completely different place. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the statue of Merit Amun, um, they've moved it to another museum. So I'm so happy that I got to see it because the first time I saw it and I just walked past, I didn't really pay attention. And then I, second time when I went to the museum, I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to take a picture of this thing and remember it. So because I don't think I'll ever yep. get to the museum they put it in now. So. Wait, no, you will. You will. And these things will be on display and we'll then have to travel between the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization and Fustat and we'll then go to the, the gem in Giza and then we'll go to the Cairo Museum at Tahrir and we'll, we'll do all of these things. But it just means for the general tourist, they will visit one not three because museums yeah. are hard on tourists and they're hard on the human mind i don't think there's something that we intuitively can connect with very easily i think we nerds on this call yeah. can very easily connect with the museum but most normal people museums are hard they're difficult to imagine what's happening they would rather go to the site and see things in a different location um so you, you know a, a we'll misunderstanding because they they probably they don't know exactly what they're looking at and even that little tag doesn't help that much no and everything so that tag what it's every object that's put in a museum is ripped from its place right and the western mind is we must now put this here and we categorize it in this way and then you put the little tag there and the tag is the thing you have to read to do your time travel to yeah. put yourself into that setting and to try to to imagine yourself into where it is and there are some people who can read the tag very quickly and do that but that's a, that's a hard, it's a very difficult ask. You have to have a lot of information at your disposal to be able to put yourself into that place. And for somebody who works with Theban data sets, and I know there are many people here who, who work with Theban data sets, or, you know, like, like Ramadan Saqqara data sets, if you pull that and you put it into a museum, um, you're, you're ripping at it, it out of its context. And it's just very hard to, to, to try to rebuild that in your mind. And then how do you do that as a curator? How does this work? Um, museums are problematic places in many ways. Um, obviously they safeguard and they display and they, they make things um, easily seen, but they also fetishize and they make it very hard to study something. Yeah. And the, the way things were displayed in the Cairo Museum was a, I loved it because it was de-fetishized. It was, these are the objects, this is what we've got and you can open a case and you can take it out and you can handle it respectfully but you can study it you put it back in and you're good when we put things into these highly blockbustery western fancy cases we fetishize them to such an extent that we cannot study them any longer and the curator will look at me and say i'm sorry you want to study this but to open this case i need three guys and it's going to get all dusty and i can't do it and and so i won't be able to get into it which means that the more famous the object the less studied it is Right, so Tutankhamen, these objects, really the best study they got was when they were coming out of the tomb. And then as soon as they went into those museum cases, boom, that's it. They're, they're in this fetishized world of, 
protection and anybody who wants to try to handle such a piece that such a precious object cannot. Yeah. And then we start putting them on these touring exhibitions. They become even more fetishized, even less accessible. And so the most famous things from ancient Egypt to a large extent are the least studied, the mm. least known materially in terms of craft specialization, in terms of, of what wood is being used, all kinds of details that we could know more about. We, we just don't. Yeah, I think it's it's John Roma that said um, he likes the Cairo Museum because the piece is lit by the sun. It's not lit by little twinkly lights that make the piece appear like it's on a on a Christmas card. So yeah, he's right. He's right. And and sometimes I have to go in with a flashlight that I've brought, but it it makes the, the other thing I'm I'm going to point out. You know how people are always saying that. Oh, objects in European museums are safer than they are in, in museums of the Middle East or museums of a de developing country. Let me tell you, as, as, and I'm not talking about politics, um, though I've seen many a piece in Berlin that, or, or Britain that has been burned or incinerated or destroyed by bombings of World War II. So we can't use that argument now, can we? Because I don't know of anything like that happening in, in the Middle East except in um, Syria and, and Iraq. And I think the United States is responsible for the latter. Yeah. But I study coffins, these wooden objects. And when I see a coffin in the Met, in Leiden, in Torino, um, they aren't ancient anymore because people have done so much bad restoration of filling in all the gaps, putting in all of this epoxy this and plastic that that these coffins are not even antiquities. I've seen coffins fully repainted, and I'll leave the museum out of, of that discussion for now, but I mean, fully repainted. I remember standing with the curator, looking at the, at the original publication in black and white, and I said, this is new paint. This is all new paint. And we looked at it and he went, oh my God. The whole thing had been repainted. There was no antiquity on that piece anymore. And, and this is on display in a really nice museum that many of you have visited. And this doesn't happen in Egypt, at least it hasn't until recently. Mm -hmm. And I see these coffins as, as they came out of the ground, very much so as they were meant to be. And um, I think that there's, that, that's very important to not mess with these objects. We think we know better than the ancient people. We think we know what, what should be consolidated and how. And I think these are often very problematic uh, restorations of pieces. So that's why, Going to Cairo has been so important to me because I see objects in their original uh, state rather yeah. than in a state for, for visual consumption by, by a museum visiting public that's perfected. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you, you mentioned now about the coffins and I know that's a, a project that you, you've been doing for many years now is studying these different coffins at different museums all around the world. But your husband, Remy, um, yeah, he's a photographer. Yeah, so I was wondering, has he helped you with any of these projects coming and taking pictures or is he, he he's been um, super helpful. And uh, we in many ways fell in love over coffins. And those of you who know my my story with Remy will know what I'm talking about. And I won't go into that here. But um, it's it's pretty common knowledge. But we, we really did fall in love over coffins, which is interesting. And um, he's he's an engineer at Boeing. He works with space and uh, satellites and all kinds of things. And he's he, he can't tell me exactly what it is he does. So I just kind of figure it out as I go, but he's really good with, um, with lots of things. Like I remember the day I learned that he could read radar. I'm like, wait, you can read radar data? What the hell? And that's when I pulled the data from I'm like, Nick, Nick Reeves, come here, give me your radar data. And then I sent that to Remy. And then I sent that to, uh, he sent it to colleagues at JPL and Caltech. And this is why I am very much a believer in what Nick Reeves' theory is because I that have, hole in the wall. Yeah. I know somebody who can read the radar data, and then I've talked with people from JPL and Caltech who also read the radar data and who can't use on me the the oh, there's nothing to see here, folks. The radar data shows nothing. I That's know that neutral. the radar data shows something. So um, you can try that, but it's not going to work on me. But I'm amazed at how many Egyptologists have bought into that. Oh, radar data now shows nothing. And then I'm like, Nick, can you send me the new radar data? And he's like, yeah, I'll send it. And, and then I go through the same process. I'm like, hmm, interesting. 
so that's not coffins, that's tombs, but it's, it's, Remy's been very useful to me in understanding um, things that are more technical than most Egyptologists are able to touch. The other thing that he's been really helpful with is developing an infrared photography protocol. So he, he can go in and this was really helpful for many of the coffins in the Royal Cache in doing a, a shot of where the cartouche is in a particular coffin, particularly one of the 18th dynasty coffins or early 18th, 17th maybe, where a name has been removed and a new name has been put in with Egyptian blue. Egyptian blue is a glass frit that shows up really well on infrared. Yeah. And so you can see, and even if you rub it away, you can see all the glass particles there of a name that was. And so I can see the reuse of something with the infrared. I can't necessarily make out the name of particular coffins, but it's been really useful in seeing reuse that I wouldn't be able to see with just my own um, eye. Yeah, it gives and, that reassurance uh, that it was, that piece was reused. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's really great. And he's good at getting the light right. And that's really helpful for coffins that are, um, and you know, Aiden knows this, Diane knows this, coffins that are in a really sooty condition that are really um, kind of carbonized or covered with like, uh, you know, things oxidized. And if you can pull out the infrared and do a photograph, the Egyptian blue will pop out. And it's, it's really, really useful to have that technical capability on hand. Um, he's also a really good photographer, so you know I can, and, and in difficult too. Oh, sorry, that's that's my calendar. People add things to my calendar, Curtis. It's horrible, um, <laughs> it's horrible. So I'll get off this call and I'll be like, "What am I doing? Okay, I'm doing this, I guess." And that's the worst. <laughs> know that your life is over when you don't have control over your calendar, and other people just get to add things in. That's that's. It. Um, but anyway, I don't even remember what your question was. Um, Remy and technical stuff. I answered it, right? I yes, yes, it. yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm happy to hear he he helps. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Yeah. Really oh good. no, he's he loves it. He just loves it, and um, he dreams of the day when he gets to retire and just do all of this stuff um, <laughs> full time. And um, he's uh, he, he's also super helpful logistically. Many of you know how much of an airhead I am in terms of finding my way out of a paper bag. I can't do that. I have no sense of direction. And um, it's amazing that I travel to all of these places sometimes alone because I don't know how I get to anywhere except that I have the gift of the gab and I, I talk my way in and out of situations and directions <laughs> and things like that. But Rev, I remember once when we were in London and we were going to the airport and I had booked the van and I had done all this stuff because I had grad students and we had a little bit of a mini team. And we're going to the airport and I remember Remy going, hey guys, aren't we supposed to be going to Gatwick? Why are we going to Heathrow? And so that's why Remy is super useful because he keeps, he keeps me keeps in my, I'm out and who knows where the hell I am, right? And Remy's like, no, Carrie, you need to go here and be practical and do this and you're in the world. This is the world. And so he brings me back to earth in a, in a useful way. Yeah, so he keeps you on track for sure, for sure. Yes. But where, where was one of, where was the first ancient site that you visited? In my life ever? Yeah, um, I think it was Giza. I think my first trip to Egypt as a graduate student back in 1994 was, you know, I landed in Cairo. I remember I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to learn Egyptian. And I, in my mind, La sounded like yes, you know. So whenever somebody would say, <laughs> I make that mistake too. I do not make it anymore. But it, I remember my first week that I kept saying la for yes, so that was a disaster. Because, you know, ya, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, la. So, but anyway, um, that was fun. But I, I remember we, um, we were staying in Cairo for a couple of days before we went down to Luxor. And we're like, oh, let's just go to Giza. And I remember standing in front of those pyramids. Um, Hawker is all about because those were the days, right? And it was, it's just a stunning thing to see. So I think uh, the Giza Plateau was my first, my first ancient Egyptian visitation. And uh, it, that, that's not bad, right? It doesn't, it doesn't ever disappoint. So. I think that's a, that's a good one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it's so funny with that la. I used to, like people would come and I'd be like, la shukran, la shukran. And I would think that's like, yeah, thanks. Um, and it's like, no. <laughs> yeah. But I, I believe that, um, your first archaeological work that you, you did was at Deir al Medina. Were you always interested in the ancient Egyptians' daily life, or was it the, the village 
the village of Daryl Medina that inspired you? My first work was actually in Theban Tomb 92 with Betsy Bryan. Oh. At, um, it, uh, and I worked on the, the funerary uh, clearance. So I was uh, connecting with the coffins and there were body parts. I mean, these tombs have been rifled through. So I was there in the tomb helping to deal with all of this detritus of death and mm -hmm. all of the things that one finds in a tomb, a shakti here, a piece of coffin there some linen fragments and I ended up doing the linen specialization. I was the linen specialist, which is weird. And I learned all about linen as much as I could, mummy bandages in particular for that. Um, and- The qualities. And, so, sorry? The, the different qualities, right. Yeah, different thread counts, different qualities. Um, the idea that linen is very hard to dye, doesn't take a dye, um, how bandages are used, how you create a shroud, things like that. You can see the reuse of something. I suppose that's the first time I started to think about reuse of a piece of clothing to make it into a bandage, something like that. Um, that work hasn't been published, but um, then for Daryl Medina, what got me in, interestingly, is in my first year of graduate school, we were doing, and I was in an art history seminar. And those of you that know Johns Hopkins and Betsy Bryan, art history is, is very much her, her area of specialization. And we were reading Michael Baxendahl's Art and Painting in 14th Century Italy. I think that is the title. Um, or is it 15th Century Italy? See, I don't know. But we, you guys can look for Michael Baxendahl. Little volume. And it was a little volume all about the workshop records and receipts and the contracts that were created to make a certain painting. How much paint of a certain kind you put in, what materials, what the panel board is going to be, what kind of wood. And it's all in there in these contracts. And I thought, huh. I wonder if somebody could do this for ancient Egyptian artistic production. Mm -hmm. And Betsy handed me her copy of Yak Janssen's Commodity Prices in the Ramesid Period. You guys want to nerd out. You need to pick up Janssen's Commodity Prices in the Ramesid Period, which is a giant tome filled with thousands of prices from Dero Medina. I opened up that book, which is not a book you really read, but I read it. I loved it. Um, almost cover <laughs> to cover that stupid book. And it's, it's um, very much a a research uh, mainstay by my side in digital form. I don't have an actual copy of it though, I really should. And, um, and I learned that these people have left records for the sale of donkeys and sandals and clothing and tombs and, and slave women hours and that there are divorce documents and that there are legal texts of all kinds. And, and then I was like, oh my God, I could, the only object that I could really apply this Michael Baxendahl type thinking to is the coffin. And that's when I started to look at the prices, saw the great variation in the prices, saw that sometimes certain um, uh, modifications were mentioned, certain craft modifications, certain materials were mentioned. And then my art historical social brain just went off and that was my first book, The Cost of Death. So that's, that's how that came about. It was, it was um, within my first year of graduate school, my dissertation was born. Wow. And uh, that's unusual. So that's, though I know in Britain, people go in with their graduate, with their dissertation already formed. But in the United States, it's it's something that we allow you to take a while to come to through yeah. classes and things. So um, for me to have hit upon that in my first year of grad school was was great. Yeah, you got to let it develop. But um, with with Dear Al Medina, the village was actually kind of run by by the woman since the men were away at work working on the tombs, and we had these women called governesses. Um, what do you think an average day for a governess at Dear Al Medina would have been like? What challenges would you face? Well, the problem with this work is that what, the, what people write down is what they have to write down. Mm -hmm. Unless, and the, maybe there are some people here who like to write journals. Um, I've never been a journaler, you know, it, it, kill me now. I do all this writing all day long. I'm not gonna write down today. I felt like this. So, some people swear by journaling, that's great. But it's not something that, that people do. It's something you kind of have to make yourself do. So you write things down because you have to write things down. And that means that the things that are written down in Daryl Medina are things that are very much associated with the work, with the, the raison d'etre of that place, with Pajer, the tomb, and their work in the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens. And those are the main things that are documented. The other thing somebody has to write down, must document this, would be 
an economic exchange that where you feel you need to protect yourself. You need to make sure that you've written this down. So in case there's a disagreement and there's always a disagreement that you have some sort of record about that. A legal disagreement, you know, some sort of court proceedings like all the papyrus salt and Paneb, you know, stuff all of If you don't know about that, check that out. Wikipedia is a good place to start. Um, <laughs> That, that's um, stuff you need to write down. When we're talking about daily life and people running their daily lives through uh, all kinds of social mechanisms, we do not write these things down. Mm -hmm. So think of the last time you met up at the pub and you gossiped about somebody's life and you're like, oh my God, and then what happened? And she did what? And she said, what? And oh no, what do you think is going to happen next? And wow, and this is the way we run our lives in terms of our social connections, our understanding of who has power, who's going through a difficult time, who needs help, who's sick. But those aren't things, you don't go home at the end of your night at the pub and write down, yeah. Janet in an affair with Bob. You know, you don't do that. You don't say must intercede with, with Mary because she's sick. Um, okay, on Facebook, we do do these things now. So it's a different kind of deal. But, you know, in the ancient world, we, you know, you don't commit these things to writing. So, so much of what we have from that village is patriarchally led. It is male led. I'm not saying there weren't any females who were literate or writing things down. That's a different question. And it's a complicated one that I don't try to touch. And I'll leave that to, to other scholars like Katrin Gabler and, and um, Toivari Vitali, who was unfortunately um, passed away. But, um, but the, you know, we can imagine lots of things, but think of Ann Austin's work. She's a former a UCLA student, bioarchaeologist who works at Daryl Medina and does all kinds of uh, investigations of the, the human remains that were left at Daryl Medina. And she's working through them now for the first time. And of course, you all know that she discovered this tattooed woman who has a tattoo on her neck and tattoo on her clavicles and tattoos around her body. And who is she? And what was her role? She was an important. She, she had on her neck that she was always speaking goodness. And, and yet we don't have the documentation to back up who that woman was because I'm not saying that she wasn't a foundation of Dero Medina society. She probably was. And there were probably many women who were foundations of Dero Medina society. But your question hits immediately upon who gets to have history. And it's the men, it's the official things, it's the patriarchy, it's those, those official formal um, means of running a life. And all of that informal stuff that is so juicy and interesting, we can kind of get at it in some of the legal texts. You can kind of get at it in a divorce text yeah. um, where, where a woman is complaining about being mistreated. You can kind of get it in a legal text where an older woman is like, you know what, not giving those kids any of my stuff and my will <laughs> because they did not treat me right. And you're like, ah, I kind of see a little bit of it there, mm -hmm. but you have to get at it three steps removed. It can be done and it's up to us to try to do this work. But those powerful women of Daryl Medina did not leave us direct records of what they were doing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think um, I was speaking to Selena the other day about it and we were saying something like, so much of what we know is actually and she used the word bullshit. Yeah. It was like, yeah. we don't know. Yeah. A lot of it is we take that and we take that, we put it here and we, yeah. we try to make up a story. Yeah. So, and I, everyone's I, creating bullshit all the time. We all do. We create bullshit on Facebook. We create the, yeah. and on social media in general, doesn't matter what your social media handle is, but we're all creating a, a beautiful vision of ourselves. The ancient Egyptians did the same with statuary and stela and tombs. And we're all trying to, to idealize and perfect as we can. And it is up to the historian to not drink the Kool-Aid and take all of this at face value, but to be much more critical yeah. and much more dubious about all of the data that is being presented to us. If they're telling us that something happened, it, it behooves the historian, particularly of an authoritarian state, to say, whom did this serve? How did this work? What was their agenda? Could there be something behind this? And to always try to look for the real politique in everything, whether it's in a domestic small household or the royal court. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Kara, I remember when I was 10 years old. Don't date uh, me, Curtis. Don't you do it. 
<laughs> go on. You're 10 years old and you saw me on a TV show. Oh God. So how much old, younger than you, than, yeah, you get the same. How much younger are you? 20 years? I, I'm 25. You're how old? 25. You're a baby. Oh, little baby Curtis. I didn't know. So young, tiny man. Um, <laughs> I keep the yes. to try and look a bit more mature. So it's, it's good. It's good. Um, so yes, go ahead with your question. I'm so sorry. I, I made it all about um, aging. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I saw you the first time when I was like 10 years old on TV. And the first time I saw you, I thought, oh my God, this chick is cool. Um, and, you know, the, the show was called Out of Egypt, um, and that was really focusing on the effects of Egypt in the rest of the world with religion and politics and all kinds of, all kinds of things. That was such a great series. How did that come about? I loved that series. That was an awesome series. And a lot of that series, I have to thank husband number one <laughs> who helped with that. <laughs> with that series and who actually um, came up with, you know, the idea of it was very much his idea. And he also was familiar with the media world. So we actually went to Discovery and pitched that show. And that's why we were producers on it and why I was able to write every script and edit, be there as an editor or in the room of the editor for every episode. Mm -hmm. That amount of work was stunning and overwhelming. And that's why there are only six. And that's why when Discovery wanted to continue it and I had a, a job at UCLA and I couldn't do both, I actually had to walk away yeah. from, from doing more of that. Um, it, was, um, it was like a second PhD, if you like, because where did we visit? You know, Egypt was a, the mainstay of the program of the, of the series, but then we also went to um, went to South America, uh, and India, and Peru, Mexico, Sri Lanka, Italy. Um, uh, we went to Cambodia. Um, where else in Asia? Uh, Vietnam. Um, you know, all of these places were. So when I, the episode on disposal of the dead, for instance, you know, why do you mummify in one place, cremate in another, bury in a third? You know, how does this work? Mm -hmm. And it, it was so interesting because then I got to go to Vietnam and watch in Northern Vietnam where they do secondary burial and yeah. watch how on the full moon that I can't, this is my favorite moment of that show bar none. This is, this was in, so insane. On the full moon, the families of Northern Vietnam collect in the graveyard and they open up the burials of their dead and they remove the bones and, I rem and they wail and they mourn. And it is like a performance, it is performative, right? Where you have all of the wailing, the family gathered around and then they pull those bones out and they, I remember this is, this is, it brings in a little bit of the Anthropocene into this. They pulled out a pair of pants fully intact because of course they were polyester and they don't break down. And this was four years after the burial of this man. And they pulled out a femur out of that pair of pants. I'm like, oh my God, look at that. Pulled out all of his bones, carefully collected them all, brought them to a washing station, washed them all. And then these guys who did this, I mean, this is their specialization. They collected them all. I remember the guy picking up the vertebrae, putting the vertebrae in order, boom, 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 boom. And then putting one hand on the, obviously the, the collar, it was longer than this, but he then balanced them in between his fingers, put them into the box. And the box was lined with a red cloth, a red and golden cloth. And the deceased then was placed into this, this box. And all of the loved ones were there watching and they turned from mourning to a celebration, to a jubilation. And their performativity was, it had turned, the deceased had now left their cocoon and had become the ancestor, the ach ikr, if you like, in Egyptian. Yeah. And to see that and to see how the, the living people gathered around this dead person and then took this little box and brought it to their home, in some cases to a Buddhist shrine in other cases, but had the physical remnants of their ancestors to whom they could then connect and pray and talk um, that was an amazing thing to be able to see. And it makes me think about anthropologically about how things worked in ancient Egypt and how I can apply some of that thinking, not one-to-one, -one, but you can apply how much we've lost of the ancient world. And um, so that, that uh, show really made me think differently about Egypt and helped me to 
to leave Egypt and come back, which is hard to do. Egyptologists have so much data and we're often so buried under that amount of data that we stay within Egypt. We, we can only handle so much. We put our blinders on and we're like, okay, I can only handle this. And we don't apply it's really so it. Much to other to handle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just so much, right? So there's a reason that Egyptologists don't engage as much as we could or should with other scholars of other areas. And we don't engage with theory from other places as much as we could or should um, because of that stuff. So that, that series was um, super fun for me to do. And it allowed me to really muse about bigger questions. And I think it's that that led me to my trade publishing and asking those bigger questions in that context as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Which leads me now, you mentioned publishing. I, yeah. I wanted to talk to you about uh, your book, um, one of your books, uh, which is called When Woman Ruled the World. And that's about six Egyptian queens slash pharaohs. Um, if any of these women had lived today, how different do you think the world would have been? Um, and here I'm going to get really depressing, Curtis. Um, <laughs> not about the woman as much as it is about the system. And one of the main points that I make in that book, which is depressing to be sure, is that this female power that arose in ancient Egypt arose to support the most authoritarian and unequal social system in the ancient Mediterranean and African world at the time. And because that authoritarian system was family led, when there was a problem, the king died too early, the next king is too young, the Egyptians being risk averse and, and embracing of the status quo for a variety of reasons, geographic in terms of lack of invasion, um, ample goods on the inside, so you don't have internal competition either. But the Egyptians were so interested in the status quo as opposed to somebody from Mesopotamia or the Levant or, or Greece or Rome, they would put a woman in charge because a woman socially doesn't have the same social power to grasp any sort of political might to herself. So they, you know, if you put the mother of the kid in charge, what can she do? She cannot kill her child. You put the uncle of the kid in charge to be decision maker, he can kill the child and take it for himself because he is socially uh, grounded to do so as a man. So the short answer to your question is that, and it's not short, the long answer to your question is <laughs> that it's these women serve the patriarchy. They served the larger pharaonic kingship and they were placeholders to make sure that you could bridge the gap from one male office holder to another. And that's why these women, when they served for a long period of time, like Hatshepsut or Cleopatra, could not serve alone. And they knew that they could not serve alone. And they had a male accompaniment on the throne next to them in some way, shape, or form. And that is why those women who serve for a short period of time only serve for a short period of time until another male could be found or ousted them from power. Yeah. So, so it's, you know, these women were extraordinary. The fact that they could rule tells us and whispers to us that this is possible, but these women were trapped within the patriarchal system that they could not bend or control or shape to be anything but what it was. And when I see people using these women, scholars in particular, to try to create a kind of revisionist history of female power, I, I call no, I call bullshit on that one. In the same way that textbooks from the Southern United States try to repaint slavery as something something that wasn't so bad no yeah. way i'm gonna look at this female power and i'm gonna see it for what it is it is it is a means of maintaining family-based patriarchal authoritarianism that's yeah. it now that may that doesn't make me not feminist though some people don't like that it just means that i'm i'm looking at it within the system that it is and yes, Hatshepsut was extraordinary, but she was also the most traditional of the traditionalists. I mean, do we want to compare to Maggie Thatcher? You could, you could. Um, and, and isn't that interesting? And that kind of turns things on its head, doesn't it? Um, so it's only now, and again, we, were, we talked about this at the very beginning of this discussion, right? right? It's only now in the last few generations that we are now able to accept women in power as equal players to men. And isn't it interesting to see that happening before our eyes and how that works and yeah. what social foundation a woman needs to be able to make that jump. Yeah. It's, um, 
it's it's yeah it's amazing how the the antiquity has taught me so much about the modern day and if i didn't have these women to whisper to me from from the past <laughs> nefertiti hatshepsut tawasret uh nefru sobek I wouldn't be able to look at female power in the way that I do. So um, for, for that, I am very grateful to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and if you look at Hatshepsut, she really had a, a struggle. And then when she died, we know all the images were erased and things like that. Why do you think the images were erased? A lot of people go, it's because she was a woman. A lot of people just go, because Tutmosis III believed he should have been Pharaoh the whole time. What do you think the real core of that was? I think it's both. I think you can have both reasons. That the, the reason, the real politic, really messy, detailed reason is that she was useful when he was a young kid and then became uh, problematic when he was trying to hand his kingship off to Amenhotep II, a young king disconnected from Hatshepsut's family. And that's when she needed to go. And that's the messy, like in the weeds, in the trenches kind of, kind of answer. But in the long term, it, the fact that this kingship is about passing it from Osiris to Horus ad nauseum forever, she doesn't fit. She is a, a side branch. She is something that must be removed. And you see the same thing for the first dynasty. When Mernath as king's mother is mentioned and put into the king list, in the tomb of her son, King Den, she is there. Yeah. And then two, genera two generations later, whoosh, she's gone. She cannot be there. So th she, they're useful in the moment, but then they must go. When, the, when you're talking, when you take a step back and you make your long king list, right? And you put that on the Palermo stone. You take a step back and you make your long king list and you put it in Abydos or some other formal temple space. That's when you decide to write your formal history and idealize it and perfect it and say, who gets to be there and who does not? Sort of like and, official. Uh, so yeah. Both work. Say, go ahead. Sort of, it was sort of like official then. Yes. Yeah. Everything has to be perfected and, and we still do the same things. Let's not think that we're... Part of my work is to try to explode modern exceptionalism. You know, in the United States right now, all we're doing is talking about American exceptionalism and how it has been... Um, exposed as a lie for ourselves and for the world to see and how incredibly useful that is. I think the virus has also helped us to explode the mythology that we have relied on for so long of modern exceptionalism, that we are better than these primitive ancient people, that we know more than them, that our histories and politics are different. Again, to use that, we should call, the, we, this is the title of this, this um, series for you, Curtis, bullshit, that we, <laughs> we are just the same as these ancient people. And we, we have much to learn from them because we are them and they are us. And uh, I see these things repeated. I think more than some of my colleagues um, and, and many of my colleagues rightly point out, they're like, Kara, watch out, you know, you're making too many one-to-one -one analogies and I have to go, okay. Um, but it's something that, that I enjoy doing and seeing my modern world around me through the lens of the past is very helpful to me. Yeah which is, is like your, your book about Hatshepsut, the woman who would be king. Yeah. Um, with, with that book, what did, you, what did you really learn about Hatshepsut? I mean, in regards to, let's say, Senenmut, a, a lot of people, oh, they were in a relationship. Oh, they weren't. Um, why do you think people think that just because she was a woman, she couldn't actually have a man as a, a friend or a close ally. What, what is your opinion on, on that? Yeah, so uh, uh, for your first question, writing that book, um, it was, I didn't know really what I was doing. I just kind of intuitively went towards it where I'm gonna try to write a human, rather fictional in terms of reading, uh, account of her life from cradle to grave and try to use all of the circumstances um, available, who was living who, who was in the palace at the time, what were their agendas have been, and try to reconstruct a human set of decisions within the system that she was living. Mm -hmm. And what I learned, <laughs> because it is an experiment to write something like that, um, to try to, to really reconstruct a life with those formal documents, to try to reconstruct how people would have been whispering in the court, how they, what could have you know, precipitated this or that big bold move. 
um, it makes me realize how much is perfected and how much we do not know. And I don't think I could have, I, I needed to go through that process to, mm -hmm. to uh, see how little there is and how in, extraordinarily perfected that story is. And I remember talking with Gay Robbins after um, at one of the book signings and, and talks that I was doing. And she said, you know, um, that book that you wrote, she's like, I disagree with, with a lot of the little details here or there, the, the, the courses that I took, because you have to make a choice when you're writing a book like that. Am I going to make her old or young? Am I going to make her, you know, is, is, uh, is her mother going to be acting as regent for Thomas II or not? You know, and I put those things in the footnotes, but I have to make a call when yeah. I'm writing a narrative. And Gay Robbins was like, I disagree with a lot of the tacks you took, but reading that made me realize how little we know about these people. Mm -hmm. And so that was, was very useful for me. It also helped me to understand that Sen and Moot and this lover discussion that we obsess about yeah. is, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really fit into, you, you can't talk about it in that way. And that we're applying our data, our ancient data from places like Greece and Rome, and we are applying it uncritically to ancient Egypt. And what I mean by that is that in Greece and Rome, you know, you could give a speech about Mark Antony and all of his lovers, um, or Julius Caesar and all of his lovers, male or female, and, and take him down politically. It's politics that we understand, that you have a, private lives of people revealed for our consumption, true or false, and they did the same with Cleopatra, of course, as, as well, but, but true or false, those things are revealed for us to see. We feel we have access to a humanity, we, and we certainly have more access to the messy real politique because you see somebody's trying to take that person down. Somebody else is trying to create an, a, an alternative narrative. It's, uh, you know, Caesar Augustus, Octavian as was, who wins the day. And, but you can see all of that messy construction. When we apply that kind of thinking uncritically to an authoritarian state, it does not work, but we really want to do it. And what I found writing that story about Hatshepsut is that everything was idealized and perfected and that not, not, I don't have to say, okay, there's this take down slander here and then this rebuttal here and try to figure out where the truth is in between. Instead, I have, there's this completely perfected document here and another one here and another one here and another one here. And then this weird thing happened. And you have to try to construct it in a completely different way, which means that the conclusion that I came to was that Sen and Moot was a new man disconnected from the patrician status group in ancient Egypt, and as such was completely dependent upon Hatshepsut. And, she, and he was chosen specifically for that. Yeah. And she, as a woman trying to get shit done in her, in her world and not and competing constantly with that same patrician class, I must assume like Elizabeth I and all of the people telling her what to do as a young woman, used Sen and Mut and was reliant upon him. So the two of them, are so closely intertwined because they, in terms of power in this system, in this authoritarian system, needed one another. And this was the perfect setup to help her get done what she needed to get done. Senem was not the only new man. And in the volume um, uh, written, uh, the OI volume, uh, Innovation, and I can't remember the title, you can, somebody can put it in the chat, um, about Hatshepsut, there's a tremendous amount written about the new men in her reign and how she relied upon them. Um, Senimut was just one of those new men. Was there a sexual relationship? We will never know. There's no way to know. And we don't really need to know. I think you should assume that Hatshepsut, like any other living, breathing human being, was going to fall in love. Don't we all fall in love? Don't we all like go gaga over somebody and just make stupid decisions sometimes or crazy decisions based on whom we've fallen in love with? I know I have and blown things up and done, or felt trapped in a patriarchal system in which you cannot do those things. Haven't we all had personal human relationships that are very different from our professional lives? Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and given that human reality that I don't think any of us can divorce ourselves from, a uh, heavy word, um, I think Hatshepsut would have had the same, but Egypt provided no place for these kings to write that stuff down. So why do we expect to see it? We shouldn't. And Hatshepsut probably had a rich and complicated romantic life. And after she became king was probably even more complicated, yeah. but we will never get access to that. It's not in our data set, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there. But that doesn't mean we have to take the one guy who was the most powerful and useful to her 
and turn him into a lover. He might have been, he might not have been. And so that's where I that's where I settle on that question. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't give any, you an answer at all. But that's any so true. chance. May I ask something? Is there any chance that Semnit could have been another woman? I don't see any evidence that Senemut was another woman, no. No, okay. he, he, right that he doesn't mention any family members, but the, uh, please somebody look in the, um, who, I see people putting bibliography in the chat. So if you can go to the OI volume, um, which is freely available online about uh, creativity and innovation in the reign of hot chefs, that there is an article, I believe written by a Spanish Egyptologist, but I can't remember, about the new men. And none of them, I believe, mention families in their tombs. And there is an argument in that article, which is brilliantly made, that Hatshepsut was a rather jealous mistress that she didn't, that she wanted all of them in a sense, that they, these men didn't for decorum's sake, to use a John Baines word, mention their families. And that doesn't mean that they didn't have families. It means that in their front facing, their public facing monuments, didn't feel they could mention those families. Now, whether Senemut was unmarried or not, or had no kids or not, I think that's pushing it too. I think that he just felt like many other people, he, he couldn't mention them, that there was something about this situation that he found himself in, that it wasn't fortuitous for him to do so. Um, so that's, that's where I'll, I'll go with, with that. Yeah. Yeah. Kara, if you were Pharaoh for a day, <laughs> God help me. what would you change? <laughs> uh for one day yeah um i don't suppose there's a whole lot that i could have done for one day um let's make and it everything did. so go on go on <laughs> let's make it a year i mean it, anything i do will be undone i know this anything i do will be undone in this context in this in this uh situation but i suppose um the kinds of things i would do would be to go down to Nubia and create a, a situation in which you didn't have labor camps that were um, as brutal as they were and, and maybe try to create some sort of more uh, <laughs> uh, decent living conditions. Um, it, it's funny because if I became king for a year, you wouldn't know it, Curtis, because I would probably be less interested in raping the earth and, my, and, and people foreign or Egyptian to get granite and gold and stuff and and build all of these monuments to build all of these monuments you have to do so on the backs of all of your people and foreign peoples with a method of exploitation that is quite brutal which means that the the people who led that may have done so with without as much um brutality we will have no record of them or very little record of them because they didn't pull from the material uh in, in mines and quarries and other places in the same way that a king like Amenhotep III or Ramses II would have done. So um, you wouldn't see me. <laughs> well, let, kind me, of let me your vizier and we'll make, I'll make sure you get seen somehow. <laughs> I mean, no vizier is gonna get power by acting like that. You're gonna try to bring social justice to people or bring a living wage, good luck. You're not gonna last for very long as vizier, not in a system like this. That's not the way the system works. And the people who get ahead in a system like this are the, the people who are most willing to be ruthless to create the most uh, in terms of deliverables for their king. And we need to be able to see that. And it's the same with most systems today. Again, let's explode that modern exceptionalism. When you look at political systems and you see who gets ahead and how, or you see who's rich in a society mm -hmm. and how, they generally didn't get uh, filthy rich by, by bringing social justice to the people who work for them. Yeah. That is, that is very true, Kara, very true, yeah. Well, Kara, you know what? This has really been such an insightful talk tonight. I, I really appreciate it so much and it's so great to get to pick your brain and hear your thoughts. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's good to be outspoken. So thank you, thank you. For <laughs> Thank you, Curtis. Thanks for um, all you do and for creating a different platform for people to, to speak in that's um, lovely and informal and, um, and very human. And I, I, think, I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm just trying to let everyone get connected. 
let us all learn from each other. I think it's a it's a good idea. So yeah, before Thank you. before we take a, a couple uh, questions from the audience, I have my quick fire questions for you. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Favorite pharaoh. <laughs> um uh, uh nefertiti oh okay we're going right there okay <laughs> um favorite place in egypt cairo museum favorite place out of egypt uh los angeles mm -hmm. favorite artifact i should have studied these curtis um uh the coffin of Thomas the third. Mm -hmm. Strangest question that you've been asked during a lecture. Um, I mean, I'll, it's either an Exodus -y question or a let's go with Exodus, but it's not that strange. It's, it's more quotidian, but um, yeah. yeah, aliens. That's another one, but we all get asked that question. So well, I don't your know. Husband, your husband works for, for Boeing and for NASA and all of that. So I think they're going to connect you with aliens some way or another. <laughs> Maybe. Um, how tall are you? Six, one and a half. And I used to be six feet. And then I started doing Pilates on the reformer and I corrected a scoliosis. So in my forties, I gained an inch and a half. So there we, there we are. I am taller than I ever was. And it is, you know, it is my cross to bear. Yeah, I, I have to I have to Google that because uh, I'm not good with feet and inches and all of that. I think so. it's 190 something. Who can put it in the chat? I think I'm 190. One... Oh my God, you're taller than me. Oh, I'm so oh. tall, Curtis. I'm taller than everybody. I'm taller than my husband. I'm taller than everybody. Everybody. <laughs> I'm 183, so I'm like, wow, you're tall. I used to be 182, but then we have to add to that a good six, seven centimeters at least, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, like craziness. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the last one, proudest moment of your life. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, probably when I, uh, it's not a moment, it's a long set of years and it's the years that I've just been through, but the years of, of finding my way into a, a very happy life and not feeling that I had to stay in a, in a marriage that um, was uh, problematic for me. So it's funny and I'll, I'll leave it, I'll make it a little more personal, but like, you know, it's, it's amazing what a strong woman, you know, you perceived as a strong woman and the kinds of things that I was an apologist for and the kinds of things that I let go in my own former life to be able to, to leave that behind and to actually truly be a strong woman and to be married to a man who actually appreciates my strength is, um, is a stunning and wonderful thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think your strength should, should be appreciated so much more. So there we go. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much, Cara. This has really been such a great chat. And now I would like to offer the opportunity to take two or three questions from the audience, some, some short questions from you guys. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> Look wow. at this. I get, I get in there. <laughs> so, funny. so I watched this documentary where they claimed to have identified Hatshepsut's mummy with a tooth. What do you think about that? Um, I am not a believer. And, and in my Hatshepsut book, The Woman Who Would Be King, there's a footnote in there with a German citation that somebody can find. I think it's Eberhard Jobeck, but I'm not sure, um, who lays out the reasons bioarchaeologically why it's probably not the mummy of Hatshepsut. But I'll make it quick and dirty by saying that the brain wasn't removed and the body was not well mummified, and that the but that bioarchaeologically the markers show that this body, this woman was quite old. And from my own understanding of the 18th dynasty and how things work and when children are produced within the 18th dynasty who are marked for power, I suspect Hatshepsut was younger, much younger than that body shows. Age aside, and Egyptologists are gonna argue about how old Hatshepsut was when she came to power until the cows come home. But in terms of the mummification quality, I think that is the nail in the coffin for, for that body being hers. So I would actually look to other candidates. There are people who study this bioarchaeologically who are much more skilled to answer this question than I, and I am just following their lead on this. But 
The other problem is that that tooth as identified has not been shown in any sort of documentation that I can look at to fit into the jaw of, of, of any body. It's, I've only seen the Discovery Channel documentary like you have and seen you know the quick cuts and the things of the tooth and oh, it fits and it's amazing. But I haven't seen any sort of uh, 3D drawing or attempts to fit that in, in the scholarship. And until I see that in the scholarship and an actual fit, like we would do with, the, with, with fragments in a museum. Oh, look, they fit. His head goes to this body or whatever. Until I see that, I, I don't think that that's the, the mummy of Hatshepsut. And I know more people will have opinions on that, but that's where I fall on that one. I see, I, I see Aset has raised her hand. Aset, what's your question? Yes, hi, Kara. Hi. Uh, my dear friend Normandy and I came to see you when you were at Butler in Indianapolis a while back. Hey and uh, so enjoyed your talk. And since then, I have really been uh, very geeky about the coffin texts and I will um, read them before I go to bed. I just really enjoy them. And my question is, um, there are many passages within the coffin texts that talk about um, that they will not eat feces, that they will not drink urine, um, that they're not going to go around upside down. Um, so outside of the main obvious, like, yeah, okay, we're not going to eat those things. Um, what was their thinking on that? Was it to say, I'm done with this life, and so I'm not going to ingest anything that I've discarded from my old life because now I'm ascended? Or... Um, I just want some insight on those two, the going through the world upside down and the other. Well, I mean, I think it's, these are very human anxieties. And when I read the coffin texts in particular, it's an insight into the anxiety of the ancient mind and all of the things that they were worried about in their daily lives. These are written by living people, right? They're not written by, by dead people, right. the dead will bury themselves. So from that perspective, you get an idea that there, and we all worry about death. Who on this call is not worried about, you know, what's going to happen to us after, after we die? Where do we go? What happens? Is there another life? All of these things. The Egyptians may not have been as nihilistic about we are, that there's many of us where for us, the question is, do we have an afterlife or not? In the Egyptian mind, from, from what I can see, there wasn't that anxiety about there being nothing, but there was an anxiety about what you ended up getting to being a prison, a, a trap, a place where you maybe didn't die a second death, but, but lived in a hellscape type existence. And that's what you want to avoid. It's very similar to the kinds of things that we th think of today that you can have a good death. People talk about that. Oh, he had a good death or she had a good death, which means that you, you move into an existence that, that has more calm and peace in your afterlife, if you believe in an afterlife. And yeah, this, this idea of doing the repugnant, eating the feces and drinking the urine, you know, that's the ultimate anxiety about that hellscape realm that, that you are trying to avoid. And the Egyptians are very much like me in that way, that they name it and they say it. People get upset with me, they're like, Kara, why did you have to go there? Why do you have to say that? You know, it might not happen or this or that. And I often go to the worst case scenario. This is a way for me to deal with anxiety so that I can deal with what I have to do. I'm like, okay, worst case scenario, this horrible thing's gonna happen. America's gonna go through civil war. Okay, how long is it gonna last? How, you know, these, this is how my mind works politically too. So yeah. when thinking about death and the afterlife, I think the ancient Egyptians did this. They're like, okay, what's the worst case scenario? Worst thing, okay, you're gonna be eating shit and drinking urine. This is the way it's gonna be. How do we create a magical spell then to counteract that? And then they go about dealing with their anxiety in this very interesting way of creating a spell and it is the action of the spell and the performativity that we cannot see of saying that spell and working with that spell and doing it with the body of the dead that puts everybody's minds at ease and lets them know, okay, we have named this horrible thing and now we have taken its power. And the Egyptians do this with everything. Think of how they, sorry, now I'm going off on a tangent, but <laughs> think of how they take the, the jackal, which is a, an animal that eats dead, flesh and bone and goes after dead bodies. And they make that animal the protector of the mummy that needs the most protection. That is exactly the same thing that is naming an anxiety, 
my body will be ripped apart limb from limb after death. I won't have that, that body that is intact. So I'm going to take the thing that is most capable of doing that. And I'm going to put that thing in charge of keeping my body intact. It will know how to do it because it knows how to destroy. So this is that Egyptian way of naming the anxiety and then turning it on its head and having power over it um, by naming it. Did I answer the, what was the second part of your question? Did I yeah, yeah, okay. uh, the going upside down, but in the, you know, not eating feces, I came across one. So understanding how you're saying this, then I came across a passage where they were like, okay, but the gods said that if I do, then that they will eat it with me. So they like pull, it was so like this comforting sentence that was in there. Um, but you get an idea, Osset, about how the cracked human mind works and how we, how we think. And think of the last time you laid in bed worrying at night, which during COVID, I'm, I'm, I don't know, all of us, and you're worrying, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do the other. And you're, you're worried about all kinds of things and your anxieties are like, okay, well, if this happens, then I'll do that. And if that happens, I'll do this. And you can see for the ancient Egyptians, these coffin texts are uh, remnants of human anxiety and how we psychologically combat that by naming it, by coming up with other alternatives, by saying, okay, if it's gonna happen, I'm gonna turn those feces into food, right? And yeah. you magically then claim it again and again. And that is, I think it's one of the reasons that we ourselves are so attracted to the ancient Egyptians because we can see some of, so many of our own human anxieties um, in them, but we see them magically combating them. Right. The, it, that we want to do too in our daily lives with our deaths. And so we, 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 are, um, we can't stop reading about them and learning about them. I think that's, that's part of their um, magical hold over us. Yeah. Right. But um, like you Thank said, you. We're, we're all uh, a bit worried about death. I've already started planning. I've got a death mask with my face on it and everything. <laughs> so. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. No, yeah. I just Thank want to you. be complicated. But actually I told my, my son, because he's the one that's going to do it, right? He's the one that's going to have to figure out what to do. I'm like, you know, what do you want to do? Do you want me to be in a burial place where you can come visit me? Or would you rather like, or Julian, come on, don't you want me like in a jar on the mantle? And he's like, that sounds cool. I'm like, and then you can be like, hey, mom, did this today. And you can talk to me, you know, in my ashes on the mantle. I'm like, and we can get a fun jar, like something crazy. You can decorate it. And he's like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> So right now we're going to funerary urn of awesome proportions. And uh, I think that that's the way it, it might it might end up. So I see um, Galen has raised his hand. Yeah, uh, it's Galen. So yeah. again, a pleasure to hear you both speak. Uh, always a pleasure. So um, but I have a question about, and it, I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot, Kara, but um, you know, KV63 had a lot of repurposed coffins. And I was wondering if you ever were able to get your hands on them. And, and it, it, it was said that there was a bit of um, like the Oxenaten, like her cartouche was found somewhere in that. And it's, for those of you who don't remember, it's kind of like the, this kind of stuff really poorly damaged. But I was just curious if you had any opinions or any stories about any of that. I, I have not gotten my hands on these things. And I'm sorry, so they're, I'm getting a new roof. Yay, during COVID, that's fun. So you all know what that means in terms of cost. But so if you hear noises, that's what that is. Luckily that happened at the very end of this, Curtis. So yay, that, that worked out well. But um, so these coffins are super interesting. And if I were, they're also in really bad shape. Um, lots of insect damage. And I don't know how, I don't know where they are but I think they're still in the tomb. Um, I would love to be able to examine those. And, uh, but, but they've been helpful, you know, photographs of them and what, what has been published has been helpful. For instance, there's a coffin in the Royal Cache that shows remnants of wood reused for, that used to have bars of inlay in it. And it's reused as a piece that's the other direction of what it would have been in the original coffin. Mm -hmm. And those inlay uh, bars are preserved and the, the wood and the channels in which they're placed is preserved perfectly in those KV-63 coffins. So they've already helped me to identify coffins in the Royal Cache that were 21st Dynasty, almost certainly reused from 18th Dynasty coffins. That that's, I mean, that's great. So just that photographic evidence has been really, really helpful, but I would love to do more with them. Um, they're, uh, they're stunning pieces. And I think there's a lot of stuff in that tomb that people would like to do more with, so. But I, I know that, 
Salima is working on it and other people are working on it. So um, yeah, time will tell. I'll be patient. Uh, Thank you Andrew. so much. Andrew, you raised your hand. Hi, um, for Kara. Do you have any advice for students who want to become Egyptologists? Yeah, on my um, my Squarespace page, my website, you can go and check out. I, I, I get asked this question so much that I actually wrote up an answer to this, the kinds of things that I think you need um, and what it's like to enter this field. Um, so I won't go into that there. You know, you, you need your European research languages. Arabic is now becoming much more accepted and useful in the white field of Egyptology than it has been previously. And it's very useful. Um, I... Unfortunately, I think a lot of Egyptology now demands a master's in, in the field before you're able to go for the PhD, which is quite problematic because masters are generally not supported financially. And that's a great outlay of cash, particularly for the American student. So if you, and I hear your accent is American, am I right? Yes. Yes. So what I would advise you to do is look for those programs that are the most bang for your buck. If you feel that a master's, because who gets to do Middle Egyptian as an undergrad? If you happen to be at a place like Penn or Hopkins or Berkeley, then you can, and you would be able to enter into a PhD program with those languages under your belt as a, coming from an undergraduate right into the PhD program, which is what I was able to do and have it fully funded. Um, now it's so much more competitive to get into the program that we often look to master's students first and the places that I find to be the most economical and the best at training the students are um, three, the ones that I, that I recommend. And that would be University of Memphis, um, which has a lot of funding for students. And you can get through this program with a minimum of student loan debt. And they, they are, there are scholarships, there's all kinds of things um, at the University of Memphis. There's TA ships, there's museum jobs, and it's cheaper tuition anyway because it's a uh, University of Memphis in Tennessee and it's a very low cost of living in Memphis. Um, and we have at least two students here in the PhD program at UCLA who've come from Memphis. The other program that I would recommend is the University of Indiana with uh, Stephen Vinson. It's uh, more of a language track and he puts the students through their paces, but he also has TA ships and ways of funding the students. So they, are, they come out very well trained, but also with a minimum of student debt. Um, and then the third place, which is actually the most expensive, ironically, but you can get a great, oh, and we have two students from Indiana, I think, maybe three now um, at UCLA. And the third place is AUC um, for, for a master's, which of course is a, a brilliant place. You're there on the ground with everything. The reason I mention it third is just because it's more expensive. You know, you have to pay that AUC tuition. This is not a, a cheap way of getting your master's in it's, um, but, but it's a brilliant degree. And what you're able to get in terms of material culture uh, exposure and the real feeling for the, the objects and the place and the geography is, is a lot. And we have a lot of AUC students at, at UCLA right now. I'm trying to think, Marianne, Nick, um, at least two and maybe more. Um, you'll also uh, hear from what I'm talking as I'm talking that UCLA is able to support and fully support with our teaching a lot of grad students. And I think we have 10 or 11 grad students in Egyptian studies or Egyptian studies adjacent right now. And we're able to do that because we're a public university that needs uh, student teachers and they are funded through their teaching. So we don't have to fund them with just straight up cash and means that we can take a student every other year or something like that, which is what many of the Ivy Leagues are dealing with. We need the student teachers and thus we can fund them. Um, we also understand at UCLA that there aren't many jobs out there. And I tell my students every day that Egyptology is dead. And I believe that as a field, it is going through a, a real fire and that we are now having to position ourselves as ancient historians, global historians, uh, scholars who connect with different parts of the world. And that's why at UCLA, we encourage students to do Egypt and the Levant, Egypt and Persia, Egypt and Nubia. And we have Stuart Smith at UCSB, which makes uh, the, the Nubia part possible. Raheem Shaigan, who makes the um, Persian part possible and Bill Sheenawin and Aaron Burke who make the Levantine part possible. So those kinds of connections also make you more marketable. Then you're not just doing Egypt, you're doing Egypt plus. And, um, 
and we pay great attention to alternative academic careers after because we all know what's happened to the university system everywhere. The privatization of this, the lack of respect for uh, careers and, and payment of a living wage, the reliance on adjunct teaching has destroyed the field um, and destroyed humanities. And as such um, jobs, I don't like my students to take jobs adjuncting. This is not a way to live a life. And so my students are encouraged to get jobs in alternative academic fields and NGOs, um, working for nonprofits, being a grant writer for some sort of an organization, um, working for the State Department. Um, there, there's all kinds of things that a student can do with a PhD as a real commodity. And that's where I push um, my, um, my great energy towards my students. Um, so I would look to the MA and, and I would also do a great deal of research on the places that you want to study. And when you're applying to these places, make sure that you tailor your statement of interest to that particular place. So you write your statement of interest. You're like, okay, I'm applying to Penn. I wanna work with Joe Wagner. I wanna do this particular thing with you, Dr. Wagner and, and go through that for each application. And that will help you to, to really get ahead in, in those um, graduate student applications. Don't go anywhere for PhD work in which it is not supported. You should never pay for your own humanities PhD, never. If you can't get in with it fully financially supported, you will do something else with your life. You will create an amazing career and you will come back to it as, as a, a donor and a booster in other ways, but you will not do it. You can't pay for a PhD. I think- That was a lot, sorry. I have a lot of, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we'll take one more question from the audience. So whoever can uh, unmute the quickest. Yes, me. Hi, Jill. <laughs> Hi, Curtis. You mentioned earlier on about radar data mm -hmm. and, um, and Nick Reeves theory. What did you find out? What, what did, did I find out? Yeah, what did it show? The, it showed that there were... so. Watanabe, the first radar specialist who put together his uh, report is since deceased, but in Watanabe's report, and Watanabe works, uh, worked all over the world finding uh, extraordinary things in many different sites. Watanabe noted that there, were, that there was a void in the north and the west, I believe I have this correct, so behind the, the main tomb wall and then over to the left, and that those voids showed signatures for metal and for, for organics. So I asked my husband, Remy, I'm like, Remy, can, how do you see that? How do you see a signature for metal and organics in a void behind a wall? He's like, well, reading the radar is like reading a Rorschach test. It's, it's something that you have to be skilled in doing, but it's something that you get kind of a feeling for. And I know we have lots of specializations in this group, like, so think of something that you have a feeling for, an intuitive feeling, um, reading data, reading, doing woodworking, some sort of craft that you're good at, where you have kind of a body feel with it. Um, reading radar, according to Remy, is very much like this. It's, and you become more specialized in reading radar. If you work in the oil industry, you know how to look for petroleum and you know how to look for certain things and you do so kind of intuitively reading that Rorschach test. Oh, there's gonna be natural gas here, we think. There's gonna be this here, we think. If you're an archeological radar specialist, you also gain that intuitive feel for reading radar to note if there's going to be fines there. And Watanabe was very good at doing this um, and has ha had a track record of finding extraordinary discoveries. Um, based on his ability to find those signatures for things that would be a potential discovery. Um, his report, and this is near the end of his life when he did this work for, for uh, Nick Reeves and, and the team with uh, Mamdou Khaldamati, um, his report was less professional than one would like, which gave a lot of ammunition to those who wanted to be naysayers and say there was nothing there. And they looked at Watanabe's report and they said, this report is unprofessional. We can't you know, look at it. The, the English isn't right or this or that. It gives no information and threw it out, right? So when I got that data and shared that data with colleagues or Remy did, JPL and Caltech, they don't work with archeological data sets, right? That's not their specialization. That's not their feeling. They read radar for what Remy reads radar for. for. That's space and, and other, other kinds of things, much different 
for, and they don't work in the geological field, right? So they don't look in, in the earth and they use it for very different things. But these people, they checked with other people and, and they're like, yeah, this looks like a void. And, it, and, and he asked, you see signatures for metal or wood? And they're like, that's not our jam. That's not something we know how to do, um, but the void is there. So that kind of information uh, from a radar specialist and the amount that I've learned about radar, it's allowed me to be able to see how different radar teams have been brought in opportunistically to shut down uh, certain um, uh, questions and to tell everyone nothing to see here, folks, and then they can move on to different things. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that there is absolutely something there. I've also learned with radar, you cannot do that. Radar is this Rorschach test. It is something where there might be something there. It's possible, but it's from, in my opinion, this radar is interesting enough that more research should be done and that, that, that somebody should be investigating behind these spaces. Um, what I know from Nick Reeves' work in terms of the art historical analysis, uh, what he was able to see on the Facto Marte scans, what he's able to do with his knowledge of architecture and how strange that tomb is, and that this could be a blind. Howard Carter himself thought that that tomb, that wall, that back wall was a blind, which is why uh, he took a sledgehammer to that back wall to see if he could break through the blind. This is something that Nick Reeves has published, but there hasn't been enough discussion of. And it's so interesting when I found this out, I was in Egypt with Nick and it's the Getty Research Institute or the Getty um, Conservation Institute that did pigment analysis of the back wall of Tutankhamun's burial chamber. And they found 1930s era paint on that back wall in a yellow and in a gray. And that means that Howard Carter, this is reconstructing something that Howard Carter did but never recorded and never talked about. Um, he probably took some sort of a sledgehammer to that back wall, saw that it was bedrock, and then covered it up with plaster and put on a nice yellow paint that matched perfectly and even added those gray spots of the lichen that has grown on that paint to make sure that he covered up his work. And the Getty has found that gray and yellow paint to be modern. Now, according to Nick, Howard Carter suspected this. If he had been just a couple of inches over to the left, I believe, he would have then seen that it was a uh, stone, not mud, not uh, bedrock, but actually stone um, possibly and a break into the blind. And if you compare that to the blinds that was found intact by Seti, at Seti the First by Belzoni and the pictures that we have, of course, mid 19th century, but they still exist or early 19th century. And the blind that was partially intact from the tomb of Horemheb, it makes perfect sense to me that that back wall architecturally is potentially also a blind. So radar can be hijacked by people to shut it all down very easily, but there is still a lot of data that is quite convincing to me, art historically and architecturally, that, that this stuff, um, and materially with that paint, that yeah. there's a lot more to be discussed in this tomb. And um, not only that, the GRI also, the, the, sorry, the Getty Conservation Institute also noted that the faces, that there is modification of that back wall, that the, the figures were changed, that paint was added, that other layers were put on, which adds more to, to Nick Reeves' theory that that coffin, that coffin, see that's where I go, that this tomb was reused for, for somebody else. Well, if so we... there's, there's tons that you could do, yeah, yeah. If we look at even Amenhotep III's tomb, Tut's grandfather, there was a blind, the, there was a little passage, a little door cut in between that one wall. So it is entirely yeah. possible. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely possible. And what drives me the craziest is people saying, when are we going to finally put this to rest? When are we going to finally stop talking about this? Um, I, the time is not right, obviously, for us to discuss uh, the potential of a new discovery politically. Um, and so we wait, but um, I, I, you guys see me out on social media and I will get in these fights with people who say, how dare you say these things and try to shut it down. And then I come back with, why are we being closed-minded? Why can't we engage with different ways of thinking? And I do this with all kinds of subjects, not just the Nick Reeves tomb controversy, though that was a blow up on my Facebook page, but also <laughs> with um, tomb building or, or cough, uh, sorry, pyramid building. We yeah. do not know how the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids. And anybody who says that we do is wrong. 
And there are theories out there that some people think are crazy. Why? Just because it's not the theory that we grew up reading about. I don't know of anybody who's found evidence for ramps that are extraordinarily long or wrap around the pyramid. I haven't found evidence for this. No archaeologist has found evidence for this ramping on the outside. So why wouldn't we have potentially of ramping on the inside? Why is it somehow anathema to discuss these theories? Um, it's interesting how academia politically and morally shoves you into a place in which you have to then follow the party line, toe the party line. And if you are so bold as to say, oh my God, somebody outside of the field, an architect has come up with this theory, you are then quashed or they try to quash you and say, you cannot say this. This is a crazy theory. They, they try to then call them pure idiots or pseudo archeologists or they denigrate in all kinds of ways. And that's exactly what happened to bring it full circle. That is indeed what happened to Watanabe and his radar, and he was denigrated. He was called a kook. He, the things that were said about him and about his scholarship were um, a typical academic way of gatekeeping, of keeping people out, keeping new ideas out. And, uh, and I think it's important for people on the inside of the field to mark it, to call the spade a spade, and to say that some of these things might be wrong, but some of them might be right. And the more open-minded that we can be, uh, the better it is for the field. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, Kara, you know, I think you and I could literally keep talking for hours and hours. And, hours. <laughs> and yeah. I would love, I would so, so love to do that, but I know you also need to get back to your roof. Um, <laughs> My <laughs> roof, oh, the roof, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so, you know what, so Kara? thank you guys for everything. This was super fun. This was super fun. Thank you so much for taking the time. I'm sure we'll chat again some other time. Um, your your interview will get posted um, Great. Sort of like next week. Um, Great. Last week I had three interviews after each other and then I had Ramadan on Monday. So I still need to post Ramadans. Um, and then on this coming Tuesday, I'm speaking to Lady Carnarvon. So- Wow, oh, will... super fun. Yeah. Awesome. So, We'll be hearing and about I discovery. I was there for part of it, but then my calendar interfered and I had to go. So I can't wait to, to see uh, Ramadan's interview. That'll be great. Great, great. So that's going to be up possibly next week, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah. So. Great. I'll, and I'll repost, obviously. So I'm looking forward to it. That's Great. Thank you so much, Kara. This has been so much fun. Thank you, everyone, for all your questions Thanks, and for guys. part. Um, before you go, Kara, I want to try something. Yeah. Um, Are we doing a picture? I want to try and do... Here, let me, I'll do a screenshot. Oh, goodness. Um, let me see. There, I did it. If I did it, you can do it. <laughs> okay. What I've done is I've put us next to each other. I want to try and do a high five, virtually. What do I do? Wait, okay. It looks so like, that, looks that, like Spock or something. Yeah, looks, so that's like correct. This. Oh, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Like that? You want it on this side or this there, side? There, there, yeah. Uh, to the other side. Other side? Yeah, like oh, that. Wait, wait. <laughs> come more over. This way, this way, uh, this way. The door. Yeah, there we go. There. And we're doing a high five. Yeah, high five. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. That was so confusing because you're mirrored or I'm mirrored. And so it was exactly We're both the opposite. mirrored and my hand feels <laughs> like it's not working properly. That's so funny. Anyway, thank you so much, Kara. We'll, we'll chat soon, okay? Yeah. Thank you, guys. See you all soon, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you so Thanks, much. everyone. And Kara, right, bye. Bye, everyone. Keep Another doing great good work. Have a great one, Curtis. Okay, good. It was great. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Very much. Great bye. job. Very good. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Am I correct? Do you live in Vegas? No, I live in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. So right now, know. living in Vegas sounds kind of awesome. And my husband and I, we said that as soon as lockdown is over, the first thing we're going to do is go to Vegas. And, um, and he's going to gamble and I'll hang out by the pool and that will be our yeah, huh? we'll have drinking. It will be wonderful. This is our dream. So this is how we're doing. Frank Sinatra was a special <laughs> gas weekends in Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, I hated on. I hated it before I, I got husband number two. And now it's super awesome because he brings me to the craps table. And it's like, 
he grew up in Hawaii, so it, gambling is in his blood, and it's so fun now. I really, I really enjoy Vegas. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> well, I love Vegas. Yeah. I've been there five times, so. Uh, yeah. What time is it there now? Is it? In is LA? It, yeah. Uh, 11 a.m. In the morning. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh. I think I've got my, got my coffee. Yes, yeah. I yeah. I my my coffee's on its way. It's on its way. Yes. <laughs> Where are you, Curtis? I'm in South Africa. Okay, you win. <laughs> That's <is> pretty cool. <laughs> Nicely, all of us are in lockdown. I don't think there's any place that isn't in lockdown. New Zealand, okay, yeah. And is that whole island the thing. There are places in the United States that refuse to have a lockdown so and for which i'm very sorry for you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how are things going in la it the covid was it, it's been bad i think we got hit with both of the variants here um in the last month and um i think we had a million cases at one point <laughs> known cases one million known cases in i think LA. los angeles has, what eight million people which to me meant that from I was like, okay, I'm just going to assume everybody around me is effect infected. <laughs> yeah. so, it's, um, it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, you just have to just have to keep safe. That's that's it. Yeah. Yeah. How's the vaccination schedule going out there, Cara? It's uh, it depends on what state you're in. So, as many of you know, we left one presidential administration behind, and we are heading into another. And that last president, it seems. Um, gave more vaccinations to states that were uh, political supporters. So my family in Texas has gotten their vaccinations with nothing to be seen like that in California. So the shortage of vaccines here is brutal and it's the same in New York and other places. So, you know, it's gonna take a couple months for things to turn around, but um, yeah, it's, isn't that awful? What a, yeah, how cruel. Cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> We've got uh, Ramadan Hussein on and Marissa. Hi Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Hey, Carl, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Long time no see, last time I saw Ramadan, we were It was a... around this time last year or what? maybe earlier? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. More than and a year. We had lovely dinner with Salima, right? <laughs> that was great. True. Yeah. yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, that was, that was a lovely evening. Yeah. I enjoyed it very much. I hope everything is well with you guys. Everything's good, everything's Fantastic. good. Um, yeah, you, I'm your good. family? We're very good. Uh, yeah, to, you know, struggling with homeschooling and stuff. So it's always yeah. Different. I've heard a bit about about Leipzig from uh, my student Vera Rondano, who's there now using mm -hmm. the library, and yeah. she says that. So if you think that Leipzig or the United States is funny, from what she tells me, Leipzig nobody wears a mask, nobody wants to participate, and uh -huh. it's um it's a no. similar sort of thing. This is correct, right? Or what? What do Not, you see? Maybe Leipzig. But uh, the rest of Germany is so strict. Bayern and uh, Bavaria in particular, now really? here in Baden-Württemberg in the south, um, it's becoming mandatory to wear the surgical mask. That's the least you can do. No, none of this fancy, fashionable ones, not anymore. So <laughs> it's been- So people follow strict. it. So it's not, it's oh, just yeah. this, it's East Germany then. Oh, so it's an East oh, German yeah. thing. It's, yeah, they're probably like that. But, and even there was so, never been a curfew here and it's been enforced if the police is just patrolling if you see somebody no reason you're on the street then the big fine it's something around 1500 euros oh, goodness. Horrible. So, yeah. 1500 euros damn. yeah it's big <laughs> it comforts me to know there are other countries where there are two countries or three countries in the country yeah. um, of course here <laughs> are at least three countries in the country yeah um, yeah. So, but yeah. it's uh, we're doing well, we're doing very well. Thank you. Ramadan. Yeah, but homeschooling, homeschooling, how's that going? Uh, Angela's just uh, crying all week because she's yeah. the one who's taking over this with Ben, and he's, here's my Ben. He's just coming to say say hi to everyone. <laughs> hi Ben. Uh, <laughs> hello. So, we heard about from your dad about your homework. You have uh, he hasn't. <laughs> 20 yeah. years from now, you'll be able to blame your parents for why you, you know, don't spell well or have sort of problems with math. Don't worry, it'll come out and work in your favor. <laughs> because mommy hey, is hey, a teacher. Ben. ben, so how is it by Mia? Mach mein Sohn? 
ein bisschen Deutsch. Und vielleicht später könnt, könnt ihr zusammen Deutsch reden, denn er lernt nur und es ist schwer für ihn. Aber du bist deutschsprachiger, nicht? Und dann könntest du es ihm beibringen. Was denkst du? Ja. Ja? <lacht> ja, ja. Ja. ich denke, das ist eine gute Idee. <laughs> Is that a good idea? God sei Dank. Um, yeah, we're going to make a trip to Germany this summer and my son and I are going to, we're going to stay with friends and get in there and see if I can really get him to be a when bilingual. I, when so, for, me, for me, it's too late, but for him, he could do it. Yeah, but you speak German, so there we go. But just, I don't, you know, I just speak it. I don't read, I don't, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't write, I read, <laughs> but but I'm not, um, I'm a fluent speaker, but I'm not, a, I'm not fluent with the writing. We, we all know that read, that speaking a language in a bar is very different <laughs> from yeah. speaking a language in an academic setting no, or writing that language different. in an academic way. Yeah. That's a completely different Are thing. So I just, you know. language in a barn or when you're raising the barn? <laughs> well, bar, uh, yeah. pub, how's that? In a pub, sorry, you guys. Oh, I think uh, it's a bar. Uh, and I imagined it was an Amish colony when you were raising No, no, there are no drinking in that Amish. <laughs> <laughs> There's certainly not snow drinking in your place, is there, Cara? Um, there, snow drinking? I said there's certainly not no drinking in your place. Oh, yes, you would be correct. Hi, um, Diane. Where's, where's Aiden? Um, he's, he's getting his pudding. Okay. <laughs> he's Diane? Yeah? Cooking. Oh, there you are. Hi. We've cut it back, Diane. We've, we've dialed it back. We're being very good in COVID because otherwise we all know what can happen. So. <laughs> well, all I can you say is talk, cheers. You, you cheers. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> hey, Aiden, how you doing? Evening all. Yeah. Hi, Aiden. Hi, Aiden. <laughs> Aiden's like hiding from us today. <laughs> yeah, he is. It's because, you know, he's, well, he's a funny old bear. Yeah. <laughs> he's, just he had, he's just finishing off his dinner. Okay, he hasn't done his hair, that's why. I know, whereas I don't bother with mine. <laughs> well, he's not very elegant when he's eating custard, you see. So he's, uh, <laughs> we all agreed no one did their hair, no one tried with makeup. It's Curtis the... did his hair, oh, please, no. look at Come on. Mm. <laughs> There's was, more thank you, Cara. Thank I'm, you. I'm always really envious of Curtis's hair. <laughs> with mine I just think like... that he puts, he puts time and effort into it, I think. Mine just looks like a bush, as you know. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you didn't. Ha you haven't got the severe hairstyle you had last meeting, did you? I mean, when you had your hair swept back, partly swept back. Oh. Yes, you had it in a ponytail, didn't you? Ah, yes. Back in a ponytail. Very severe. <laughs> Couldn't recognise you at first. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter. Like, Sarah, I was stressing so much tonight. I was like doing my hair. And it's like humid because we're having so much rain and it kept going straight. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the trouble here. The idea of having so straight hard. hair is wonderful. I just have long COVID hair, right? Yeah, but you have such nice waves in your hair. It looks great. It looks great on Zoom, C Curtis. Let's just say that. I love my hair on Zoom. My hair on Zoom, I'm like, oh yeah, look at that. I love hair on Zoom. And then I go out and I look at it in the real world in a mirror and I'm like, oh, so Zoom hair. <laughs> Well, at the moment, it zooms all that matters. Yeah, you know, people have electronically produced backgrounds. <laughs> mm. You're going to have your own. Yeah, I put, could put up a space background or a temple background, but the hair doesn't work well with all this background, so I generally leave it. Shall we? Shall we begin with the the proceedings? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs>